Greetings, Arboretum people. It's so good to see you all. I'm thrilled to see that so many of you had taken time out of your busy schedules to tune in this afternoon, and I'm honored to have been invited to be um, part of Midweek with Mark. Um, you can just slash out Mark and put my name in. Um, perhaps uh, in the future, I might show up again every once in a while, but I really I, I, I thank Chris and the staff of the Arboretum uh, and Mark for the opportunity to talk with you. Um, if, if you were part of the, um, the Gardening in the South uh, Symposium, um, what, what Chris asked me to do was um, to finish my presentation that I was giving in that symposium where I had about an hour. And uh, unlike Mark Wethington, I wasn't given any extra time because I, I ran on. So this is, this is kind of a little hybrid, a uh, little hitting to all fields for us gardeners. And, in the southern region of the United States. Uh, I'll be talking about some of the things that I spoke about during that, uh, that symposium, but I'm, I've also included uh, a number of other um, topics that, that I, I, I think are really important for us to be thinking about this time, this time of year. So sit back, enjoy yourself. It may be a little bit too early to, um, to have a glass of wine, but I, I, I hope you'll, be, you'll get yourself comfortable and um, I look forward to chatting with you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen right now. And Chris, if you'll give me the thumbs up on the screen, I will. Coming through nicely. All right. So um, uh, the title, I guess today we'll say tips. Tips. I'm not gonna tell you how many because that way you'll know, you won't know whether or not I, I get finished or not, but tips to better gardening Southern style. Um, uh, I included my, my contact information, my email, should you uh, want to contact me with any questions or comments about um, today's presentation. Uh, but I, I, I really am, I'm very thrilled to, to be here. And um, the first slide that you see is um, right from the get-go. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is um, I try to do some unique and different things in my garden from a year, on a yearly basis. One of the greatest things to me about gardening in the South is that uh, uh, there are, our growing season, our frost-free growing season is so long, it gives us some real flexibility with a, with a lot of plants that aren't necessarily hardy year round here when it comes to buying small and having them, having them go big. And when I say go big, for example, um, you know, I, I've really become quite a fan of, of incredibly hot peppers not because I, I eat them, but because I find them to be incredibly, incredibly beautiful. And take for instance, this um, pepper display that um, I grow a lot of ornamental hot peppers for, their, uh, for the fruit um, to, to, to actually cut and display in bowls indoors. And this is, this is a, 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 called a, a yellow um, Trinidad scorpion pepper that is somewhat convoluted in its shape. And, and, and you take them and, and you can decorate with them in, in a decorative bowl or, or, or somewhere inside. And y'all, I, I, I harvested those um, about uh, a month and a half ago and they lasted a good three weeks before, uh, before I had to, uh, to put, them, put them out in the compost pile. But just an example of something that, that you know, I'm still, I'm still collecting peppers even the end of October. We haven't had a, you know, a killing frost yet and, and we may or may not in the next few weeks. Um, I want to start out by making sure that um, y'all understand um, a really important concept when it comes to gardening, which I know I'm preaching to the choir on a lot of these, and, and certainly um, any, in, any input that you, you'd want to provide would be certainly appreciated. But um, for me, the, the key to gardening, I think, is um, facilitating an environment where the plant can be quickly established. I think plant establishment is the absolute key for good, good gardening. And, and when I talk about establishment, I'm really talking about the root system. It takes a certain period of time, whether you're planting an annual in a four inch, in a little, you know, two and a half inch pot or a plug, all the way to, to good sized bald and burlap trees. It takes time for those roots to reestablish themselves or establish themselves in the soil. And, um, and what, what research shows is that um, for plant establishment, which is key, to the long-term survival of a plant, post-plant watering is absolutely crucial. And, and y'all, to that end, there are some guides that we can follow in the Southeast region of the United States. First of all, it's, it's been pretty much established that for perennials all the way to trees, the establishment time um, can range anywhere from four months to two years. 
and that with water loss being the, the crucial part of establishment, depending on when we plant the plant, we need to be um, diligent when it comes to seeing to it that, that our, our, our newly planted plants are watered on a regular basis. So here's a little guide, maybe you've seen it in the past, where uh, a tree, the, a newly planted tree requires about 10 gallons of water per week per inch of caliper. Now, when I, when I talk about inch of caliper, I'm gonna get my little, my little pen here. Now, when I talk about inch of caliper, I'm talking about the diameter of the trunk of the tree. If you look at that photograph, you can see where I'm drawing. About six to about six to twelve inches above the the soil line. That's that's called caliper, and it's the diameter there. And so, if you were if you had a newly planted tree that was one inch in diameter, then it's going to require about ten gallons per week. Now, all in all, that's not a lot of water, and um, obviously the distribution shouldn't be all at once. I like to split it up twice a week. I'll do five gallons. And if you're not sure how much is coming out of your hose pretty easy. Go down to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy a five gallon container. Uh, take your favorite hose, turn it on full, and then uh, take your stopwatch and measure the amount of time it takes for that five gallon container to, to fill up. And that gives you a flow rate. So you can get, you know, 10, if, if five gallons, it takes a minute, then, then you, you know uh, what your flow rate is and, and you're able to, de to determine how long you need to be um, watering those plants. Medium shrub, about the same, 10 gallons per week. Y'all, when I say medium shrub, I'm talking about a shrub that might be going in the ground at three, three feet by three feet. If it's less than that, then you'd back it off to five gallons. Flower beds, generally five gallons per 10 square feet. And here's the one that I really wanna call your attention to. Lawns generally require 15 to 30 gallons per 10 square feet per week. And so you can see the level of demand for water in the turf grass is significantly higher, three to six times higher than, than, than other plants and plant beds. And so um, that, th that and a couple of other things will, will um, help me argue about how I think we ought to be using turf you know, in, in, our, in our landscape. Um, so here's, here's really the importance of establishment in the landscape. Um, like I said, um, you're going to get um, a two-week establishment. Um, it's going to take about two weeks for newly planted annuals to become fully established where um, they can be pretty much on their own. Um, but normally for trees and shrubs, it's going to take anywhere from four months to two years. And I don't know how many of us spend that much time tending the newly planted plants that it would take two years of assistance when it comes to water. But establishment for plants is going to depend on a number of things. Obviously, it's going to depend on when you plant. Um, Y'all, if you're planting your trees and shrubs today in end of October, beginning of November, obviously your establishment time is going to be less because once those plants go in the ground, even though they're starting to go dormant, uh, you're still going to get good root growth through the month of November, December, and even in the winter. And so by the time uh, water stress comes around in April and May, those plants have got a, a, a root system that is uh, facilitated by the fact that its upper portion hasn't been stimulated to grow very much. Um, the kind of irrigation that you give that plant is gonna influence establishment time. I know a lot of people plant a one inch caliper tree, they'll water it for the first month and then they'll just let it go. And it may not die, but I can guarantee you that the roots are not establishing themselves as quickly as if we tended to water. It also is gonna depend on how that plant was grown, whether it was grown in a container or in a, in a nursery, uh, bald and burlap. And so it becomes very important that we research and, and make sure we understand how that plant was grown and then how we treat it when we plant it relative to regrowth of roots. Um, the size of the plant. Now, um, I know I'm speaking to a very diverse group of folks when it comes to age, um, but um, the research shows that the smaller the plant, the faster the establishment. And so um, I, I like to go small and, uh, and know that my plants are going to be established a lot quicker than if I, if, I, if I go large. Now, certainly many of us are going to want instant landscapes, but know that the larger the plant that goes in, um, the more time you need to spend ensuring that it gets irrigated properly. And then obviously species is a, is a very important part too. But here's a very, very important word. Don't be fooled. All right. Uh, just because a plant is native to this region of the country doesn't mean that it doesn't have an establishment time that we need to tend to. Michael Dern, his book, uh, Manual Woody Landscape Plants, will say, oh, this plant's native and it's drought tolerant. But it, what he doesn't say in that text is, 
once established its drought tolerant or once established its pest resistant. And so we still need to tend to establishment for the, the native plants. Now we need to make sure that we give plants a good start. Um, people always ask me how big should the hole be? And my answer is the bigger, the better. In this photograph here in the bottom left, you can see that the, 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 the hole in this case is a good 12 to 18 inches wider than the root ball. Um, but I, I, my response is the larger, the better. But many of you who have taken classes with me know what my next response is. And then I, what I tell them is, please stop thinking about the hole and start thinking about the hole. One of the challenges we face in gardening in the Southeast is soil that is uh, that uh, may not necessarily be ultimately conducive for growth. And when I say that, it's not just because we live in the Southeast, it's really because of uh, urban and suburban development such that most topsoil is lost by the time we move into a suburban landscape. And, um, and so it becomes very important that we build that soil. And so what I like to, what I like to um, advocate is let's stop digging holes in spots in our yard or our turf and let's start thinking about beds and, and preparing those beds with good compost and, and, and organic materials and, and amend and, and, and build that bed and then plant in the bed. Like you see in the, the photograph on the bottom right, uh, you can see this plant bed with a tree and some shrubs in it. Rather than dig a hole and worry about what goes in and out of that hole, um, prep the entire bed. Now, I know some of you are probably looking back saying, well, that means, that really means that I've got to rethink the way I design my landscape. And my answer to you is, you bet, it sure is, because I think this is really not the way we should think about installing trees or shrubs. Now, certainly some of you might be saying on the left, well, these arborvitae are gonna create a hedge or a screen and I'll just dig holes in my lawn every four feet apart or three feet apart and they'll be fine. I maintain that if we, if we cut a bed and created a landscape bed and prep the soil, that our, our hedges and screens would grow very well. In addition to that, you can see the, the tree on the right that was planted, the, the, the small bed around that tree. We know that absorbing roots of trees grow 90% more when those roots are under mulch than when they're under turf. There's significant competition with turf. And so why not create a landscape bed, you see, that would incorporate more root zone under mulch such that the roots would not be impeded or have that level of competition. Again, another possible conclusion would be, ooh, um, I, I need to rethink the way I design landscapes. And I, I'd encourage you to do so. Why not take an area and incorporate um, organic materials and prep the bed and then, and then design plant beds and, uh, and strategically locate turf? I'll have some comments about that in a few minutes. Uh, here's a situation in, in a, a, hot, a, a yard that is predominantly turf where this bed was cut, the main maple tree was planted in the middle and then other plants were planted in that bed. And the research shows that these plants are gonna actually perform quite well, not providing as much competition to the roots of the tree as turf grass would. Or like our own JC Ralston Arboretum, thank you, JC. The late JC decided the way he would create an arboretum is he would, do, he would take a number of uh, build beds throughout the arboretum and then, and then tur allow turf grass and whatever else would come up in the paths um, along those beds. And so here you can see two examples of uh, a kind of a, a approach to, to landscaping where you've stopped thinking about the H-O-L-E and now you're thinking about the W-H-O-L-E. And so that would be my encouragement to you. Now, I know that means that we might rethink the use of lawn. So I wanna talk just for briefly, and I did speak about this during the symposium, home lawns in the South. We have some challenges when it comes to growing turf grass in the Southern region of the United States. Here are the challenges. First of all, um, if you're from the Northeast or from the upper Midwest, like I am, I'm from, from Western Massachusetts originally, um, you know, bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass was the, the standard cool season turf of choice and it performed very well. But the, the Southern region in central North Carolina, and those of you who have come from the mountains, you, you obviously can grow some turf, cool season turf a little bit better than we can here. The, the, the season's really not ideal for um, fescue and bluegrass or even mixes thereof. A lot of plant breeding going on for turf grass that can stand the heat and the drought. But we do get summer dormancy in cool season grasses. 
And then conversely, Bermuda zoysia and other warm season grasses leave our lawns looking like you see on the right, somewhat brown and, and dusty for a, a more months than we care to have because they go dormant when it gets cold and they, they turn that brown color. And so we have this balancing act to do with turf. And then, and so in fact, turf grass um, uh, professionals will tell you that central North Carolina uh, and down east, even a little bit, we, we represent what's called a transition zone when it comes to growing turf grass, where um, both kind, both warm season and cool season will grow here, but they require a significant amount of attention and input or a significant amount of compromise with what, we, what it is we're looking at. My next door neighbor reseeds with fescue-based uh, fescue based cool season grass every single year. And in essence, he's growing turf grass as an annual. Uh, and, and of course, there, that's just the challenges that you have. In addition to that, check this out. 22 plus million acres of, of turf grass are found on home lawns. And 80% of the homes in this country have a lawn of some sort. Uh, Americans have a real fetish for turf grass. Um, now, lawns are, turf grass is a plant, it doesn't make it evil. It just, it will sequester carbon, it will reduce stormwater runoff, it'll do all those things, but it's, it's about the largest monoculture we'll have in our garden. And, and so turf grass takes up valuable space for what I'd like to promote as a biodiverse landscape. Um, there is strength in biological diversity, and uh, the more we mix it up, uh, the better we, tr we, we, we deal with wildlife, the better our ecosystem works, the better we have with stormwater runoff. All these things are improved if we, if we strive to have a biodiverse landscape. And turf grass takes away from that. It sh I believe it should be part of the landscape, but maybe not so much as it's been. Turf grass is the number one water user in the home landscape. You saw that three to six times as much water and then think of the other inputs think about fertilizer think about pest management um why would we why would we use turf as something to cover the ground with as home gardeners why don't we use turf as a ground cover where we choose locations strategic locations where turf grass uh, might enhance our area lawns require significantly more inputs overall and so as a result my recommendation is to maybe consider reducing lawn square footage. Now, I realize this can be a sensitive issue in the family or in a, in a, in a particular um, uh, garden situation, but um, in 19, back in the mid 1980s, I, I came across this beautiful lawn in the Highlands of Scotland where the turf grass, by, the homeowner was using turf grass as a ground cover and the turf never touched the margin of the property. And as I looked at this, I saw, wow, now that's, that's a more ornamental use of turf grass, I think, is that it's actually become part of the plantings and, and, and treated as such. You can put a little bit more effort into it because it's so much smaller, it doesn't require the same level of inputs an entire yard would be. And so when I saw this, I said, someday when I own a house, I want that. This is what I want. And so this is what I got. There it is, there's my lawn. Uh, it, I sodded it, uh, I, I, I can water, I can reseed, I can, but the level of input time and effort that that little turf grass plot takes is significantly less. Now, some of you know me, know that I have um, six grandchildren, three from two different daughters and families that live right in Raleigh. And when they come over um, with their sporting equipment, it's kind of difficult to play soccer on that, on that lawn. Thankfully, I live behind a park and the park has a dog park, hiking trails in the woods, a, a turf grass fields where we can go and play soccer. And, and you know, maybe we need to start thinking about um, the way that we design community. And this is just a, an editorial comment, but is it possible that we might be able to design community where not everyone has to have a soccer field in their backyard, um, that we're within walking distance of ma nicely maintained park areas where, um, where people can play? And so that's, that's just something to think of. And, and I'm very blessed to be able to do that in that I can walk out my back door right into a park where I, I have a number of things that I don't have to provide for myself in my own, in my own yard. But that gives you a little bit of perspective on, um, you can see I'm trying to mimic what I saw back in the mid 1980s. Now, um, if, you were, if you were at the symposium, Gardening in the South, um, I would, when I, just about when I ran out of time, my next garden tip had to do with managing crepe myrtles in the Southeast region of the United States. It was one of my favorite topics, and I think some of you might be quite surprised. 
to what I'm going to say. So crepe myrtle, wonderful southern tree. Not everyone loves it. My mom, um, my mom and dad moved from Massachusetts to Burlington, North Carolina, in a retirement community there. My mother absolutely hates crepe myrtles because all the flowers, when they um, start to fruit up, all the flowers, you know, shed their their petals all over the sidewalk around her condo and that aggravates the mud out of her. She considers these trees the messiest things on earth and has really never fallen in love with this, this, this um, wonderful um, southern tree. But y'all look, take a look at the, hab the habit of growth on this plant. We call that vase shaped and you know that's a classic small tree habit of growth that um, many of us strive for, patios, small landscapes, that type of thing. Um, but, but generally what's happened in the history of the crepe myrtle in the Southeast is they get treated like this. And you know what was, you knew what was coming, that, that for some reason these crepe myrtles have been pruned in a way that has ruined their natural habit. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask you, you don't have to answer uh, by unmuting yourself, but, um, and there is a term that we use uh, where we talk about non-selective pruning of crepe myrtles, like you see right here. This non-selective pruning um, gets, gets a name, and, and, and we'll identify that name in a second. The value of crepe myrtles, uh, if we maintain their natural, ha natural habit, is we can get something, we can achieve something like this that you see. Here's a beautiful alley of, um, of uh, a fantasy crepe myrtles at the Atlanta Botanic Garden, and the ambient temperature in the dead of summer underneath this, in this walkway is anywhere from six to 10 degrees cooler than out in the open. And, and, and so by, by performing this non-selective pruning on crepe myrtles, we literally eliminate um, the natural habit of, um, of these plants. Now, uh, the, the, what I love about the, the, the fantasy crepe myrtle and townhouse crepe myrtle is the beautiful exfoliating bark, that cinnamon color that generally occurs right during the, the week of 4th of July. You can actually set your calendar to the to the uh, the Lagerstromia ferii fantasy crepe myrtle in that the exfoliating bark it's an event and it happens during the week of July, but yes that's right we call we call it crepe murder and um, it is a it is nothing but a nondescript method of pruning and by the way um, since I'm talking to 281 people I want to make sure that you know that this is not a judgment statement about how any of you prune your crepe myrtles. All right. Um, this is this is just some information that I hope will clarify and help you um, decide how you want to prune your crepe myrtles. As a professional horticulturalist, this this kind of pruning is called crepe murder. Um, as a gardener of almost 40 years, I no longer call this pruning method crepe murder, and for a couple of different reasons. Firstly, um, when you prune a crepe myrtle like this, non-selective down to branches like this, they never die. Um, established crepe myrtles will respond significantly when we prune them like this in the early spring by sending out a multitude of shoots that are going to produce a multitude of flowers. Crepe myrtles happen to flower on this season's wood, and so all the pruning that we do on crepe myrtles in the spring results in branches that are going to yield flowers if these are in a, a sunny enough location. Um, so it shouldn't be called crepe murder because Crepe myrtles never die when we prune them like that. So what has happened? One, we have destroyed the natural habit of that tree. We've, we've destroyed it. Now, does that mean that we're wrong or that we're ignorant? Well, if we didn't know that we were doing it, then that would be considered ignorant. If we did it knowingly with the, with the assumption that by doing it, we're going to increase the number of flowers and have more, uh, more stems with more flowers, uh, then maybe that's not ignorance. Maybe that's not even um, a bad horticulture. That's just a commitment that you made to ruin that, the habit of that plant. Um, there's a lot of pruning techniques that change the natural habit of trees and shrubs. And depending on where you are in the world, we'll either call them ignorance or we'll call them topiary. So that's, I, I'm, I'm kind of shifting a little bit when it comes to Crepe myrtle. Now, let, let, me, let me also say one thing. I would never prune one of my crepe myrtles like this, but that doesn't mean that if you did or you wanted to, that you'd be absolutely wrong. And I think um, in the spirit of JC, who tried just about everything on all plants, um, I think he would, he would certainly um, maybe echo what, what I'm talking about. Let's not call it crepe myrtle, let's call it crepe maining, um, because the plants don't die. 
their habit is, is um, thwarted. And this was in Sanford, North Carolina. Here's a person that started to do some crate maiming and then had second thoughts that maybe they were hurting the plant, so they stopped. Um, so this is the worst of both worlds. It's um, not pruning it back that way. And, and then it is pruning it back that way. And so this is kind of humorous. I thought it was kind of funny. Crate maybe. Oh, and in lieu of the fact that the holidays are coming, if you do prune your crate myrtles um, like this, where you, you whack them back indiscriminately. By the way, we call that non-selective pruning. That's the, the formal term. Look what you can do with them. You can decorate with Christmas lights. It's way easier to put Christmas lights on a whacked back crate myrtle than it is on one that's, that's tall and has a beautiful vase-shaped habit. And please understand, I'm just being tongue in cheek here, but I did come across this crate myrtle that was decorated quite nicely with lights. But let's, let's just pause for a moment. I, wanna, I just wanna talk about pruning cuts. This is just a little five minute primer on pruning. And this applies not only to crate myrtles, but also to just about any plant. There's a difference between selective pruning and shearing. Shearing is a form of non-selective pruning where we just cut inadvertently through leaves and stems. Selective pruning involves making a choice as to where the pruner is gonna cut. Selective pruning takes a whole lot more time. It takes thinking and it takes some, some effort. But there are two main pruning cuts that we can employ on any tree or shrub that are effective. And I wanna share with you those two. So here we're talking about two selective pruning cuts versus non-selective pruning, which is just inadvertent. Uh, the first type of cut is called heading back. And the heading back cut is very simply where you cut back to an outward facing bud. Uh, you cut back on a stem to an outward facing bud because when we prune here, this bud breaks and starts to grow. And being that it's outward facing, the branch is gonna grow outward like such it has a much better chance of improving the habit of the plant. Whereas if we prune above a, 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 a bud that faces inward, it's gonna stimulate growth toward the middle of the, that shrub. And that certainly could create some crossing limbs. But we have choices with, with heading back. We can cut here or we can cut here. Uh, and heading back cut is used a lot to handle shrubs and trees that might have a wild hair growing out, as I call it, a branch that's going out too far compared to the rest. I, I use heading back cuts about 10 to 20% of my pruning during the year. Most of my pruning is something that is called thinning or um, specifically called drop crotching. Now, I know that many of you may not have ever heard the term drop crotching. What we're talking about here is the concept of crotch in horticulture is referring to this spot right here where one branch meets another. That's considered a crotch. The angle created by the crotch is called the crotch angle. And when we use the thinning cut, we are pruning back to where one branch meets another. That would be called drop crotching. So the cut we would make would be right there. Now, what's fascinating about drop crotching is we can influence the habit of growth, we can reduce size, we can thin out a canopy, we can do all those important things for pruning and not, not uh, take away from the natural habit of the plant that we're pruning, if that's our desire. And so 80 to 80 to 90 percent of all my pruning cuts on woody plants basically are thinning cuts. And after I've controlled size and pruned quite a bit, uh, a passerby wouldn't necessarily be able to tell that it's been pruned. That's one of the beautiful things about, about drop crotching. So if you've never pruned like that, consider maybe trying it. And so here's a perfect example of uh, me and my pruners drop crotching. There's the, there's the branch. I'm cutting back to where one branch meets another and voila. Because remember, for every pruning cut you make, it stimulates a growing response. And when we drop crotch, the growing response is well distributed throughout the entire plant and not localized like a, like a non-selective cut or even a heading back cut. And since we're talking about crepe myrtles, I wanna, I wanna share with you one of my favorite crepe myrtles and it's Lagerstromia indica orchid cascade. Um, there it is right there. That's, that's orchid cascade. I have a, a retaining wall that moves around the, my sunroom. And um, I got this at an Arboretum giveaway. Orchid cascade grows about two to three feet tall and weeps. And it's got this beautiful um, pink 
kind of deep pink, almost lavender flower, and, uh, and, and works very well in a container if you've got a long to container, or like you see here, along a retaining wall or a, a, along a wall to cascade down. So there it is there. Um, here it is from a different angle. You can see how, um, how it fills that space. Now I will tell you this, through confessions, this crepe myrtle gets pruned back to six inches above the ground every February slash March. And this represents the growth I get in one growing season. And that's why I love growing and living in the Southeast region of the United States over say living up north because I get to, to manage my plants this way. And this thing is never gonna overgrow this spot. But I love the way that it, it, it grows out and down. I can train it. And then the, the, these wonderful flowers that, that, that show up too. You notice a great color echo with the millennium um, allium there, that, that flowering onion. Another tip that, uh, about, that appeals to me about growing, living in the South is um, how, how late fall provides us with a lot of good color from flowers and, and, and plants that I, growing up in the Northeast, um, by the time you hit October, you were done with flowers um, on plants and uh, all you, were, you had left was maybe some residual fall color. So um, here's a, here's a, uh, I'll just share with you a few of my favorites. Um, there are two in that, this slide. The, the small red flowering ground cover is uh, called Evita hardy gloxinia. You can see the scientific name and you can practice pronouncing it after the, after the presentation. But the Evita gloxinia was, um, has been um, a, a plant that um, comes from Argentina. And uh, I, I first met this plant um, at Plant Delights Nursery. Tony was talking about it um, very well. Uh, if you look, you can see that the, the shrub around that plant, that herbaceous perennial, is, uh, is one of my favorite um, ligularias, and we'll talk about that in a second. But keep in mind, y'all, about the Avita. First of all, this, um, this hardy gloxinia comes out late in the season. If you don't see it until June 1st, it's doing fine. Uh, it, it's a herbaceous perennial that overwinters. And then you're going to start getting these beautiful red trumpet shaped flowers that the hummingbirds really enjoy starting in early to mid August. And then they just keep getting more and more as the nights get cooler. And so I, I am in, inundated with the Avita. It, it spreads by underground um, stems called rhizomes as well as tubers. Uh, there you can see the beautiful um, yellow edged flower with the red corolla that, um, that really adds to the fall landscape. Uh, to that, I also um, would share with you my favorite Ligularia. It has a new scientific name now called Farfugium japonicum giganteum. Uh, this, this is the giant Ligularia. Uh, historically, this plant gets the name tractor seat Ligularia due to the large leaves that shape like, you guessed it, a tractor seat. And uh, so take a look at the size of the leaves, anywhere from 12 to 24 inches across. There's my hand in that left-hand side. One of the reasons I included it under flowers in the fall, uh, my giant Ligularia uh, flowers, the, the photograph that you see there was taken last year, right before Thanksgiving. And so here's, here's a plant that's a very late flowering Ligularia and produces these beautiful yellow flowers. The only thing, the only challenge I have with this one is if you end up with a severe cold, and I'm not talking about frost, 30, 28, 29, 30 degrees, these flowers will be fine. But if you get a 25 degree air mass that comes in, these flowers are gonna be way more short lived. And so that's the, that's the balancing act you have with, oh, with that plant. Uh, another plant that uh, may be more of a September plant, um, the, the two plants that are gonna attract I'm just trying to turn this off. Before, they, um, before they migrate, probably early to mid September, the zinnias, the annual zinnia profusion, zinnia profusion orange, as well as the sulfur cosmos, the cosmic orange sulfur. And that photograph on the right was taken in the perennial border at the Ralston Arboretum. Uh, it was probably the first or second week in September. So that cosmos is, uh, can be perennial, but it also reseeds and comes true from seed. So I, lo I love living in a place where um, even our summer annuals like fireworks, gumfrina, will not only um, continue to flower into the fall, but then those flowers will dry right on the vine and, and, and they, can, they can stay there and, and will stay there and give you good color because I've dried these upside down indoors and, and they hold their color fast. They hold that 
that, that magenta color. But not only that, but um, you can see the kind of space they take up. And um, you can see what happens um, late in the season. This, this photograph was taken in early January and you can see the gumfrina in the background um, that um, when, the, when flocks of bluebirds come through and use the bird bath in January, um, I had the opportunity to enjoy the bluebirds with the, with the magenta colored gumfrina in, in the background. Uh, one of my favorite annuals for hummingbirds is, and many of you have heard me talk about this plant, is salvia dancing flame. It's an annual, the dancing flame salvia. It's a, a plant that has a variegated yellow and green leaf that grows about two to four feet tall. Uh, the plant that you see there uh, came from Big Bloomer's Flower Farm and in Sanford, North Carolina, and was uh, a, in, a, in a two inch container that I paid $1.99 for. Uh, planted it um, in the second week in May. And by early September, I've got this kind of floral display. Um, the hummingbirds absolutely love this plant because of the red flowers and the high nectar. And they fuel up on this before they depart in the end of September and migrate south. Uh, so I, I love the contrast between the yellow and the green leaves and the bright red flowers. Don't expect this kind of flowering in midsummer. It's sporadic in midsummer. But as soon as we get um, shorter days and as soon as um, mid-September comes in, this thing just takes off when it comes to, to flowers. And it took me many, many hours and a whole lot of patience to finally um, capture uh, hummingbirds on the dancing flame. This photograph I took a couple of years ago took about four or five hours on a Saturday morning being still as a rock um, waiting for the hummingbirds to come to, to photograph them. One of the other late flowering salvias that um, certainly adds to the southern landscape is the golden delicious pineapple sage. Again, another hummingbird favorite, and I, I thoroughly love the contrast between the yellow leaves and the red flowers. Um, okay, another gardening tip. Uh, gardening in the south gives us this wonderful opportunity to play with zone eight plants. These are plants that um, actually grow better down east. So for those of you who are down east and even down into South Carolina, um, we envy you because you can plant these zone eight plants and not worry about whether or not they're going to make it or not. Uh, Bob Lyons taught me that a tender perennial is a plant that in, its, in, it, in the right zone, it behaves as a perennial, but in the adjacent cooler zone, it might require a little bit of protection for it to survive, or maybe you'll just plant it and see if it makes it and for how many years before we have significant cold. And so I, I, I just wanted to share with you a few of my favorite tender perennials, the colocasias. Uh, there are many colocasias that are indeed hardy in zone 7B and 7A, but many of them get a zone 8 and 8, 8A and B rating. And therefore, when we plant them in their garden, if we don't either dig them up and, 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 and uh, keep them dry in a cool place like our garage or crawl space, or we don't protect them in our own landscape with mulch or uh, pine straw, then, um, then they, they're gonna behave as annuals. But hey, um, every, every, the one you see in the middle slide there, that one's called black coral, uh, Colocasia esculenta black coral. And that one, um, again, I bought it, it was in a four inch container and had two small leaves about three inches tall. And uh, that photo was taken in midsummer. And so what I love about um, the South, what I hate about the South is the heat. And what I love about the, the South is the heat because that heat and warm temperature allows a lot of our tender perennials to just take off. Here's uh, another black coral in a container with, a, with one of the ornamental sweet potatoes and a Bolivian begonia um, cascading down on the side. So you've got some real flexibility with these tender perennials. Uh, beware, some, some that might be considered zone eight are actually zone, B, zone 7B or even 7A. Uh, this, is, uh, this is one that I, I planted uh, a couple years ago. This is Colocasia esculenta coal miner. And um, I planted a four inch container. And this was what, what it looked like on uh, September 1, the year I, last year when I planted it. It overwintered without any protection, y'all. And uh, it, a coal miner spreads by above ground stems called stolons. And then uh, the stem runs along and then produces a new plant at its tip. So um, all my gardener friends love me for this plant because I will dig these up, pot them up and share them. Uh, but beware, it's an incredibly enthusiastic plant. Um, I wouldn't call it invasive, but it certainly is enthusiastic. If you're concerned about it overspreading an area, then just grow it in a container and keep an eye on the stolons. 
But this is the end of the second year. This was this photo was taken back in September this year. So after two years, you can see that it has really established itself as a as a beautiful uh, mass planting of coal miner Caucasia. Uh, my challenge, my decision making here is: What do I do? Do I dig up dig up some and dispose of them? Do I dig some up and pot them up? Or do I, yeah, I have if I have enough space, do I let it continue to grow out? Uh, but I will have a challenge there, and that's one of the fun things about gardening in the south, some of the plants that might not make it further points west and north, or they might grow slower further points west and north, are almost virtual weeds here in the central portion of, of North Carolina. And that gives us, gives us some options and some choice. But you can see there's the, there's the plantlet, and right there is the new root system that's starting to grow down. So I just, I'll just cut it right here, pot it up, and give it to a, um, to a gardener that's interested in it. A couple of my favorite tender perennials, one on the left is called Euphorbia cotinifolia. The, um, it's, a, 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 it's a herbaceous perennial in zone eight and nine, uh, grown often as a house plant, but also grown, as you can see here, as a tender perennial. Um, oftentimes we can grow this in a container and then bring it in the garage, let it just go semi-dormant in the garage, making sure that it doesn't dry out completely. And then um, the variegated ginger on the right, um, Alpina um, zurembet, uh, variegata um, in some places, some protected locations in um, in the, the central North Carolina landscape, it'll it will survive. Um, however, it could also be dug up and overwintered in the crawl space or um, in the garage as well. Um, or you could perhaps provide some protection. Some of the zone eight plants that Tony grows at Plant Delights, he'll take a large um, wire frame, a chicken wire frame, and put it around a plant, and then fill that frame with leaves that act dried leaves that act as insulation in the winter. He'll do that in the fall. So that's another um, technique. Guys, one of my biggest surprises as a gardener when I moved to North Carolina back in the early 80s was that you can take your, your amaryllis bulbs that are, you get it during the holidays and you display inside. And once the chance of uh, real cold temperature is gone in late March and early April, you can plant the, plant the bulbs outside uh, with the neck of the bulb being right at the ground level. And um, most of, many of them are, are, are hardy. They're, they'll perennialize and you'll be dividing bulbs uh, for years. Here's one, of, here's this hippie astrum, this, this amaryllis I planted over 20 years ago and I have divided it three or four times and have lots of, of amaryllis bulbs uh, scattered throughout the, the garden. Some plants might be considered tropical or considered um, tender perennials when um, the reality is they are indeed uh, a perennial in a hardy in zone seven. And that would be the, the Musa volutina, the, the, the fuzzy pink banana. Uh, Musa volutina was given to me, one little um, plant in a, in a gallon container was given to me a number of years ago by Danny Werner. And now I have um, three different patches of this plant. It overwinters without any um, any protection whatsoever. And in a good year, the flowers will produce these small pink bananas that are full of seeds. And I just say that because I've, I read that those bananas can be edible and um, don't, don't waste your time. Uh, you're spitting seeds out more for just a little bit of an edible banana. But I did have a conversation with Denny Werner about this plant. And I do know, I don't know if he's still doing it now that he's in retirement, but I do know his idea was to cross to breed the Musa volutina with our, with our fruiting banana, our tropical banana, in the hopes that someday we'd be able to have a temperate zone banana plant that we could grow in our own backyards and harvest bananas like we eat on our cereal. Um, certainly, um, Tony Avent and, and the Arboretum, J.C. Ralston, and a number of other um, gardens across the Southeast have um, identified many, many agaves that are now hardy and can be grown in the, in the Southern landscape. And I've actually, I, 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 I never really got into agaves until about three years ago. Now I grow most all my agaves in containers and, and all the ones that you see in this, this shot here don't go inside for the winter. I take them and I put them on the North side of my house um, underneath where, where I control their moisture and, uh, and they survive just fine. Uh, what we've learned about agaves for their survival is that uh, the hardy agaves in, in, that, that are hardy in our region um, don't mind the cold. It's not the cold that kills them. What they can't stand is a wet root system in the wintertime. It's the wet cold that just drives them crazy. And so y'all, if you're, if you're growing agaves, eat, grow them on a mound if you're going to grow them in the ground. 
Um, make sure the soil that you put them in is incredibly well drained. If you go to the Scree Garden in the southeast, um, the south section of the Arboretum, you can see that that soil is, is made up of a, a large amount of organic matter mixed with permatil. The, the, the North Carolina company rock called Stalite. Permatil is used for bowl control, and I'll talk about that before we finish up today, as well as um, uh, can be used to improve drainage. And uh, so I, I overwinter these on the north side where it stays moderately cool. The temperatures don't change a lot because the sun's not beating down on them. And these, these plants do just fine. And then I'll just water them occasionally just to make sure that there's a, a little bit of moisture in the, the, root, the root system. And I, I'm getting really good growth during the growing season because during the, the, most of the, the season, it's incredibly warm. And I make sure that they don't, their roots don't rot by potting them up in a, um, a very, very, uh, almost a gravelly organic mix of soil. Um, and you can see the pups that are, that are popping out in this variegated one here and here. And so agaves are a great plant um, that I, I wouldn't even think of, of growing in the Northeast. Um, I, I, I talked, I, I, I referred to the, the challenge that we all have with voles and squirrels. And as a gardener of uh, 37 years in the same place, I've had voles almost every year and I, I still have squirrels in my garden. It's a, it's a big challenge. And I just wanted to share with you some of the attempts that I've made to, uh, to manage voles and squirrels. And please notice that I use the word manage. I didn't use the word control or eradicate. I think um, with most pests in our gardens, it's a matter of management. That's what good stewards of the, of the landscape do is they manage pests. And when it comes to voles, I have, uh, I've, ha I've developed some, some, some um, interesting approaches. So um, voles are very small, um, almost mouse size, maybe a little bit smaller in mouse size. They, they, they burrow underneath, they're not, vol they're not moles. Moles are larger um, subterranean animals that eat grubs, Japanese beetle grubs and June bug grubs, and mostly in our lawns. Voles, on the other hand, um, enjoy eat, they're, they're, um, they're not carnivorous, they're herbivores, and they enjoy eating tender roots of our favorite plants. And in fact, I think voles figure out what my favorite plants are, and then they go and eat those favorite plants. Uh, and so I've, I, there have been many, many um, cuss words spoken in my garden by me uh, because of, of the voles. And um, they'll usually show with a small mound, or you can even see holes where they pop out. Um, there's one there. Here against my retaining wall, there's one there. Evidence. Or evidence would be that a plant looks like this one day and a day later, it's completely wilted because the voles have been feeding on the root system for the past three days. So here are a couple of management um, uh, tools. I um, have been known to grow uh, castor bean. Uh, Rhythmus communis carmencita is the red leaf castor bean. It produces these beautiful pink fruits that have the classic castor beans inside. And, and I'll grow these in my yard. They'll get anywhere from eight to 12 feet tall. Uh, uh, and I know one thing, the, the voles don't go anywhere near the plant beds that the castor beans are planted in. Castor bean make that the, the, the poison called ricin. Uh, and uh, that poison is, exerts an influence in the soil um, for a, 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 a varmint, if you will, a rodent like a vole. Here are what the castor beans look like. These are the seeds. Uh, please note that they are poisonous. And so um, if you have any kind of a human or an animal that might take to eating these, then you want to take some care. Um, I have six grandchildren ranging in age now from 13 to five, and I've never had any issues with them getting near these plants to the point where I had to put the fear of death in them by telling them, don't eat those because um, these kids know that you're not supposed to eat anything in the garden unless you get permission. So nonetheless, there they are. And what I do is I'll collect these seeds. I grind them up. I put on latex gloves and a knife and I grind them up and create, um, create this um, slurry, if you will, of, of castor bean uh, pieces. And then I will take them and, and pour them down into their, their runs. And um, it becomes a repellent. They're not gonna come and eat this, but they, they know that this is, this is certainly not good for them. And um, this will repel them in certain bed areas. I've had some success with that. The other approach you can take for voles is you can mix this material called permatil um, in the soil and you have to mix it pretty heavily and voles 
have tender noses and, and, and paws. And so by incorporating this into the soil, you can actually block the voles from some of your favorite plants. So that's something that I do. But I'm talking about it and showing you some photographs of plants that I grow in containers that have a, a quarter inch layer of, um, of uh, permatil on the soil surface. Well, that, that is what I use to repel squirrels. And what I mean by that is um, when I put a quarter inch layer of permatil on any plant I grow in a container, I've never, and I repeat, I've never had a squirrel root around in those containers. I've actually done some anecdotal research where I planted half my containers and used the permatil mulch. I planted another half of containers and I didn't. And within hours, the squirrels were rooting around in those containers that didn't have this. Squirrels have tender noses and paws as well. And they don't particularly like to have to negotiate through this stone. Um, a bag of permatil runs about um, $15, $18 and goes a long way as a, as a mulch. Uh, you might not like the way it looks, but for me, it's an acquired taste. I've really fallen in love with the mulch because, hey, I know that I'm not going to get any squirrel invasion there. So there's the product on the right, permatil. It's, it's great because it's a North Carolina product. Um, I highly encourage it. It discourages voles. You can use it as a vole block, but I also um, like to uh, promote it as a mulch around my plants. And it really looks good with succulents with a lot of the succulents that I grow outdoors like you see on the left. When it comes to my, my other approach to managing voles is I don't plant some of my favorite plants that I know are the voles favorite plants in the ground. What do you do? I plant them in containers and I set those containers in my garden and, um, and the voles don't get to the, to the roots. And so here you can see this big blue hosta, it's in a container, if you look, Carefully, you can see there's a little container there. Look on the left. All the hosta that I grow in my landscape, I grow in containers because I know that they are bowl magnets. And anytime I have ever said, oh, I don't have any bowls this year, taken a hosta, planted it in the ground. It's almost like a, a text message goes out to all the bowls in the neighborhood because within a couple of weeks that hosta is dead. So for those of you who enjoy growing hostas, but that don't because of bowls, my recommendation is plant them in containers and incorporate them into your landscape. Here you can see a, a smaller leaf blue hosta next to a, a maidenhair fern in a container. I like to use a lot of, what I love about gardening in the South is you can, you can grow a lot of or, uh, herbaceous perennial plants in containers and not have to worry too much about overwintering them. I'll just take them and just put them up in the north side of the house as I, as I mentioned during the symposium. And, um, and as long as they don't see sun, they go dormant and they do just fine. I've actually gotten really excited about epimidium and in my indecision as to where to plant them. I just went out and bought some clay pots and I'm going to have an epimidium garden in containers. No, voles don't go after epimidium. And at some point I'll probably go ahead and put these bishop cap plants into the landscape. But in the meantime, I like, I like to do this. And, and some of you may be saying, well, you surely have a lot of pots that you have to water during the growing season. Well, my answer is you bet I do. And that's one of the reasons why I garden. It, for me, it's very zen to grab my, grab my garden hose and go out and water my containers after, uh, you know, after a day of, of, of work, um, either teaching or, 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 or training or something like that. So that's one of the reasons why I garden. It's, the, it's the, the process itself. And the last thing that I'd like to talk about and take maybe about 10 more minutes of your time is how in the Southeast, it's important for us to manage fall color. The idea that fall color is a beautiful thing that in central North Carolina, we can actually make decisions about what plants to grow and where to grow them that will enhance the fall color that we have very timely. So I'm gonna do five minutes on the science of foliage color and then a few more minutes on how we use, uh, we use fall color. Of course, we know that chlorophyll is the main pigment in plants that is responsible for assimilating sugar for producing sugar from carbon dioxide and, and water, that process called photosynthesis, that's the pigment, all right? And it's responsible for the green color we see on plants. But chlorophyll also has two helper pigments, xanthophylls, the yellows, and carotenoids, the oranges. Now, xanthophylls and carotenoids are in the plant all the time. And unless the plant is a cultivar that's, that has got the propensity for one of those colors, like you see the uh, the yellow saguaro fall cypress in the upper right-hand photo, or the, the fall color of Fathergilla, 
but un unless unless these these plants are coated for that we'll see green and we never see the yellows or the oranges okay and the third pigment that plays a major role in fall color are anthocyanins those are the reds now anthocyanin pigments are red and they are not present during the rest of the growing season like the xanthophylls and the carotenoids so if you look at yellow thora fall cypress here, Cami cypress, Pacifera, Filifera aurea, for you scientific name buffs, it's, it's genetically coded to be yellow. Now, does that mean it doesn't have chlorophyll? Well, that's the way it looks. But here's the deal. This plant's chlorophyll concentration is way low, and its xanthophyll concentration is way high. And so in a full sun location where the plant is still able to photosynthesize with a limited amount of chlorophyll it has in it, it's going to appear yellow. But check this out. If you reach inside and you look in the shadier um, locations of the plant, what do you see? You see green foliage. Um, take this yellow plant and plant it in the shade and the yellow plant becomes more green. It's not that the xanthophyll fades, it's in less sun, it becomes less photosynthetically efficient and therefore the plant adapts to that shady location by producing more green chlorophyll. And that green chlorophyll masks the yellow. So basically, here's, here's the, the basic principle I like to, to share. If you have ornamental plants that during the growing season have burgundy leaves or yellow leaves, um, they are going to require, in general, they're going to require a higher light intensity than their green straight species relatives. So take, for instance, smoke bush. Smoke bush has a a kind of a green leaf with a beautiful pink smoky flower. But if you, if you buy royal purple on the left or ANCOT on the right, that you know two things. One, you know they have high concentrations of yellows and purples, but you also know that they have a low concentration of chlorophyll. And therefore these plants are gonna require a much sunnier location than the straight species. Japanese maples, um, there's nothing more beautiful than that huge cut leaf Japanese, red Japanese maple in the, the, the circle at the arboretum. And in the early spring, it has this beautiful burgundy color. It has chlorophyll, it's just masked by that gorgeous burgundy color. And y'all, just so you know, if you're new to North Carolina, your Japanese maples are gonna look like this in April and May, as soon as the heat load comes, as soon as we get warmer weather, the red pigmentation in this plant is gonna fade and the chlorophyll is gonna show through. The plant's not dying, it's not suffering. It's just accommodating that heat because this red pigment is sensitive to temperature. So finish up here talking about the science of fall color and temperate deciduous plants. Let's, let's, let's look at the, 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 um, the, the stimuli. Um, in the fall, we get decreasing day length. We call that photo period, which is really translating into longer nights. That happens after September 21st. And then we have gradually decreasing temperatures. Now, this is the one that's quite variable in the southeast in the fall. Um, this year, I think we've had actually an early fall and not we haven't had those high uh, summer-like temperatures in mid-October that we had. We had a, actually a very beautiful fall, warm, sunny days, cool nights in October. But these two environmental stimuli stimulate the beginning of dormancy in our deciduous trees and shrubs, those trees and shrubs that, that drop their leaves. It also stimulates dorm dormancy in evergreens. And, and this stimulates a, a series of physical changes. Let, let, me, let me just pause here for a second. It's like when we get up one morning and go down to get the newspaper, for those of you who still get a newspaper, you go outside one early fall morning and we feel a chill in the air Oftentimes that stimulus tells us, oh, I've got to get my winter sweaters out of the back bedroom and put them in my drawer because winter's coming. All right. So there are certain things. Oh, the days are getting shorter. My wife and I can't take a walk in the evening as much anymore because the, it gets darker sooner. Those are stimuli that tells me, oh, it's time to pull out my sweatshirts. You know, I got to get out my JC Arboretum, JC Ralston Arboretum sweatshirts uh, because cool weather's coming. Same situation with plants, but it's a physiological thing. They're not thinking. So what happens? Things like the water in between cells in a plant disappears. So when it gets cold and freezes, that doesn't cause cell damage. Um, the plants begin to go into a condition of lower respiration rates for sugar conservation and slowing growth. And the other thing that happens is abscission. The leaves fall off. And that, that's, not an, that's not an immediate thing. It's a gradual thing. And we can be thankful of that. 
And this all leads to the ability of these trees to tolerate sub-freezing temperatures. So fall color the process. How do ultimately these leaves begin to change like this? Well, if we look at a stem, and there's the stem, and these are the petioles of leaves, all right? We, we, we see when these stimuli happen, the shorter days and the cooler nights, this region right here where the leaf attaches to the stem, stem um, it's the beginning of the formation of what's called the abscission layer. This is where the leaf is gonna separate from the stem. And the beginning of the formation of the abscission layer is nothing more than a traffic jam on I-40. You say, what are you talking about? No doubt most of us have been in traffic jams on I-40. What happens? The movement of cars slows down due to so many cars because usually there's an accident or construction. Well, this beginning of the abscission layer, this region right here, when the days get shorter and the nights get cooler, material begins to build up in these cells. All right, and the material is tannins, oils, and it begins to clog the pathway of water and nutrition up and sugar down. That's what happens. You, in this sense, get a traffic jam where you get a backup of sugar in the leaf and you don't get as much water and nutrition into the stem. So this, for those of you who've forgotten what a traffic jam on I-40 looks like, here you go. And the materials that fill up in the cells between the leaf and the stem, something called gunk. Okay, that's a technical term we use. Um, it's just tannins, oils, and material begin to, to clog those cells. And so the movement of nutrition and water into, this, into the leaves slows down. And as a result, chlorophyll, the green pigment, which is a dynamic pigment that constantly relies on a continuous supply of nitrogen and magnesium into the, 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 the chlorophyll begins to fade, all right? The movement of sugar out of the leaf slows down. And so there's a buildup of sugar back in the leaf. That's called a sugar pool. All right, so what happens? Well, the chlorophyll fades and what shows up? Ah, the yellows and the oranges that were there all along, we just didn't, didn't see them. And so if we look at all color in summary, one, decreasing temperature and photoperiod stimulate the beginning of the formation of the abscission layer. Two, flow of water nutrition slows down, we get a traffic jam. Three, the flow of sugars out of the leaf slow down. We get another traffic jam and we get a backup of sugar in the leaf. Four, chlorophyll production slows and the existing chlorophyll fades. Five, the leaf fades in green color and other pigments show through. I'm sure you've heard that all, the, all along. So the only finishing touch on, on fall color is the red pigment. Where does the red come from? If it's not there before the chlorophyll fades, where does the red pigment come from? The development of red pigmentation is a function of the daily climate. Now guys, this is different than the stimulus for dormancy, but it still is climatically related. The right combination of sunlight and temperature during the day and night is the key to maximum anthocyanin production. There's that red pigment, check it out. Warm sunny days contributes to the buildup of a sugar pool in the leaf. Cool, crisp nights minimize excess re respiration and therefore retains that sugar pool. And we're really looking at night temperatures below 40 to 45 degrees. Okay? We don't start to see dynamic bright fall colors until we get nights that drop around 40 or 45 degrees. Now the large sugar pool and combined with those low degree nights stimulate the conversion of the sugar to the sugar-based pigment called anthocyanin. And so that's why red pigmentation in the fall varies significantly due to geography, the mountains to the coast. Mountains have much more beautiful fall color, typically because they have more days that are warm and sunny and more nights that are cool and crisp than, than the Piedmont, than the coastal plain. And so the intensity of fall color is often influenced by geography. It's also influenced by climate. Rainy falls result in more even temperatures, more moderated temperatures, and the color isn't as vivid. A lot of people would always say, oh, we had a rainy fall. The, the fall color is going to be muted because the rain washes the, the color out of the leaves. Just not true. Okay, Take Cornus Cusa, for instance. There's one of my favorite Asian um, small flowering trees with the white flowers um, outside of the, the, the leaves. It, it develops a beautiful red-based fall color. Look at that. 
So check this out. If you, I was looking at my Cornuscusa a few years ago and I was really, really quite proud of the fall color. I was convinced that that plant was in the right location to get warm, sunny temperatures and experience cool, crisp nights. But I noticed this yellow halo around the leaf. So I moved that yellow, I moved that leaf out of the way and I saw this beneath it. Then I moved it back, then I moved it out again. Y'all, there was about a, a 16th of an inch of air space separating this leaf from the three leaves it was over. Is it possible? That, that little 16th inch of an air layer created enough insulation, a blanket of air, if you will, to prevent these three sections of these three leaves from getting cold enough to convert the sugar pigment to reds? And the answer is yes, that's how sensitive this system is. This is like a magic trick, right? Do you realize the ramifications of something like this? No, it's not the leaves can be multicolored. It really says that where we put our plants in the landscape is going to influence the microclimate that we put them in is going to influence their ability to produce an intensity of red color. Even if it's sensitive enough, in a, even on a leaf, it's going to be sensitive enough on a plant. Put, a, put this tree next to a red brick building and the backside of the leaves, the backside of the tree that faces the red brick won't anywhere be anywhere near as red as the leaves that face away because the red brick will radiate temperature back, radiate heat back of those leaves, insulating them from the temperatures that get below 40 degrees. It's that sensitive a system. You say, well, if that's the case, then why won't this tree, this shrub right here, this bottle brush buckeye, I've planted it in places where it gets lots of sunlight, nice and cool, never does it produce uh, red fall color. That's because there are many plants that we grow that don't have the genetic capability to produce the red, the red anthocyanin pigment. Just like many of us can roll our tongue, many of us can't. Bottle brush buckeye is just one of those plants that can't roll its tongue. So this is gonna be the color, therefore is influenced by the climate regionally, mountains versus Piedmont versus coast. It's influenced by the amount of rainfall we get in the fall. It's influenced by the, the fall temperatures. If we have it quote unquote Indian summer, our fall color may not be as brilliant. Uh, it's gonna be influenced by the native species. That's why the uh, Appalachian mountain range is noted for its beautiful fall color is because it has species that genetically have the ability to produce these beautiful reds. It's also gonna be influenced by microclimates. So I'm gonna finish today's presentation on, on midweek um, giving you the example on how we can influence the kind of fall color plants that have the ability to produce anthocyanin pigments. So let's say you live on a house on a hill. You can make that hill as deep, as steep or as shallow as you want, right? And you have a Japanese maple that has the ability to produce gorgeous fall color. You've got three different spots where you could plant it. Spot A is up on the hill in full sun. Spot B is on the slope in partial sun. And spot C right down here is in a low lying area in full sun. Which spot is gonna provide you with the most intense, potentially the most intense red fall color? Well, it's not gonna be that one because air sinks and you're gonna get air movement. It's certainly not gonna be that one because not only are we having air, air moving, cold air sinks, but we've got some shady aspect going on here. So the fall color here may be muted. No, it's gonna be this Japanese maple that you planted in the low lying area. I'm sure many of you know what parts of your yard are cooler in the morning than others. And that's gonna to contribute to that sugar pool. That thing that we, we, we call the, the recipe for anthocyanin production. So I'm gonna stop right there. Um, I hope that there have been some nuggets that you've been able to take and, and use. What, what I wanna do is I'm gonna do a little advertisement since, um, since um, I wanna do a little advertisement since Chris uh, didn't advertise on my behalf. And so I'm, I'm gonna do that real quick here. Let me find it. Uh, a little thank you uh, and, um, and a, little, um, a little advertisement for a class that I'll be teaching at the Arboretum. So um, once again, thanks for your attention. Um, I'll be teaching um, starting next Monday night, a Zoom class. And that Zoom class is entitled Gardens of the World Part Two, uh, Western European Wonders. Um, Y'all, this is a seven week class where I'll take you to a number of botanical gardens in Italy, France, 
uh, Netherlands, Germany, and just share with you some of my travels through those gardens and also some of the things that I learned and have applied to my own. Now, the class is going to be Monday nights from November 2nd to December 14th from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. No class on, on, on November 23rd. And um, you can go to the, the J.C. Ralston Arboretum calendar, click on Gardens of the World Part 2, and you'll be able to register for it. Um, so with that, I will um, relinquish the screen and thank you for your attention because I know that you all didn't have to, to, to provide it. So um, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Bryce. That was awesome. We did get a couple of questions fairly early on that were a little more personal in nature, so I saved them for you. Okay. This goes back to uh, having the garden versus the lawn. Deborah wanted to know or commented that the gardens were beautiful, but wanted to know how much time you spent weeding. Oh, um, I don't spend a whole lot of time weeding. My my beds are pretty established, and I, I put down about um, an inch and inch and a half of um, of soil conditioner every year as a mulch, and that contributes to weed management, but I practice what I'm calling biological weed Look management, my where I pack left. my bed so full of plants left. that the weeds don't have a chance. And uh, on a sort of related note, uh, Shana, Shona asked, how do you mow your teeny weeny lawn? <laughs> on a writing I take board. a little pair of scissors and I go out on my hands and knees <laughs> and no, I actually use a, I use a weed eater. I use an electric powered weed eater. It takes me about 37 and a half seconds to mow it. That's what I thought. And I also use the weed eater to edge to keep that kidney shape. So if I didn't answer your question well enough for you, go ahead and break in, ask Bryce your question again. Uh, maybe you can put it in the chat. I'm looking to see if anyone had any additional questions in the chat. whole lot of thanks in there, Bryce, of course. I appreciate that. You need your uh, sound, Judy. Okay, Val asked that, or commented, whoops, they're coming in too fast, so it just moved off the screen. Let me see if I can find it again. Val commented that she has a Daphne cortica that is supposed to grow in the mountains. What do I do with it um, here in this area? You ever grown that one, Bryce? I, I've never grown that, but the 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 fact that it's in the it's in the Daphne family it indicates to me that um, we're looking for soils that um, don't hold moisture uh, and create wetness in the winter. The the Daphnes, the Edgeworthias, are plants that um, can be short lived if we don't. Uh, provide well-drained soils and so my recommendation if i were going to plant that plant here in central north carolina i would build a, a raised bed i'd build a mound a mound of very very well-drained soil and i'd plant it in there once again i'm convinced that daphnes don't mind the cold what they do mind is the wet cold and so anything we can do to um to to, to provide a more well-drained winter soil would should help daphnes be uh, more long lived, but I, I'm not that familiar with that specific one. You might want to check the uh, obviously hardiness zone is okay. The only problem with that Daphne in this region might be the heat load. I just don't know enough about that plant. Okay, and Myra asked for pointers for her new Ruby Falls. She's wondering any pruning practices for that one. So um, Ruby Falls Redbud is one of my favorite plants. It was actually planted next to the, the pink banana, that I, the, that photo that I showed you. Um, so when it comes to Ruby Falls, I always wait till the end of February and I, I evaluate the, the stems. And here's what I look for. One, any dead branches. You're going to get some dieback on Japanese maples. You're going to get dieback on redbuds look for, for dead branches. They're gonna be a little bit different color. I will often take my hand and, and just run along and they'll snap. So I do that kind of what I call snap pruning with my hands. The second thing I look for are a lot of branches that are, are crossing over one another, that real real heavy duty cross, crossing branches. I'll, I'll, I'll just do some thinning in the spring. Um, but that's about, about the size of it. My experience with Ruby Falls for the past gosh, 10 or 12 years that I've had it, 
Um, it's required very little pruning other than removing the dead, the damaged, and any kind of infected branches. And, and it really doesn't get infected with much of anything. So um, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. I just got a private question, so I won't say who it was from. Um, she's wondering what kind of soil conditioner is best used for mulching. I can just tell you the one that I love. It's um, and and I wish I should probably contact Home Depot and see if they'll give me a, a contract, uh, a, a sponsorship. But Home Depot sells um, something called um, soil conditioner. It's Timberline is the company. It's a it's an orange bag, and it, I think it's it's under three dollars for a forty pound bag, and it's some very small horticultural grain pine bark, and I find that to be excellent. And Val says that she has a Japanese maple that has totally different leaves coming out of the top. Is this normal? Uh, no, uh, chances are what's happening is you've got branches of um, the branches are growing up through the top from down below. Inspect it because it sounds to me like you've got some, some um, branches coming from the rootstock, from the stock of the plant that it, it's grafted on. That's my guess. And so if you follow those different looking branches down, um, if they're down below where the plant is grafted, that would explain that they need to be cut off. The other thing is, Sometimes when we have a summer like we've had, a summer and fall that's been incredibly moist, um, you'll get water sprouts, you'll get these suckers that'll come popping out and they grow so vigorously, they look entirely different. Um, the leaves look different color, maybe a little bit larger than the others. And so in that case, um, either prune them out or prune them back using those pruning cuts that I recommended. That, that's what I was thinking it could be. Yeah. yeah. Paul has asked, or asked for a clarification, so to be clear, does the non-selective pruning of crepe myrtles delay flowering significantly? No, in fact, um, I think you get, you get more flowers um, and uh, the delay, I don't see any delay in timing. They'll, they, they'll flower up just when all the other crepe myrtles are as well. I would think so. And not really a question, but Carolyn commented that her Japanese maple doesn't want to drop its leaves. They hang on all winter. <laughs> I haven't seen the Japanese maple do that, really, but I have seen some other plants do that. I, I have had one that, that, that's stubborn as well, and it's just a matter of just being patient. I have one in the front yard that always seems to need the um a cold freeze to kill back the leaves they stay greener a lot longer than the rest of them but they do eventually fall off they do they do and it's not yeah. delaying anything in the spring if they stay on like that and val just asked a question that was asked earlier in the program and i'll just repeat my answer and i'll ask you if you have any other ones Val says that uh, crepe myrtles keep on suckering everywhere. What do we do to get rid of them? And I commented earlier that the suckering is often caused by digging around the crepe myrtles because damaging the roots will cause them to, to grow because you can't grow that one from root cuttings. So just stop digging around them. If you have to just put mulch in there or just don't do anything in there, I wouldn't even plant annuals around a crepe myrtle because you're probably gonna get baby ones to grow. And I commented that if it's totally severed from the parent plant, you can use an herbicide, but I would not dig the plant out. Because you're just going to damage more roots. I would concur on all that, Chris. Yes. Okay. Sounds good. Um, Patricia says her chase tree is old and overgrown. When and how much can she cut it back? I got to be careful how I answer this one. If it's so old and overgrown, why not dig it up and get rid of it and go get a, a, a nice little one? Number one. Number two, if it's old and well established, uh, I would cut cut it back as far as you want in the in, J in February, and March and um, and watch it re-sprout. And the next question might be kind of related. It was asked privately. Uh, she wants to know when to prune the crepe myrtles uh, in late January, for instance. What was her comment? January, February, March before they before they flush out. Yep. Yep. And I think that was the end of the questions. Well, that's good because I've got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank, thank you so much, Bryce. That was awesome. Thank I'm you, glad everybody. we didn't have a Appreciate stop button this time around. I look, hey, guess what? I look forward to seeing many of you next Monday night. How's that for a plug? <laughs>
Yes, thanks for plugging it, Bryce. I knew you'd do a better job than I would, so I left that one for you. Thank you, everyone. I sure appreciate it.